It should come as no surprise that PC gaming is absolutely fantastic, but there are countless ways to make it better. And in fact, some of these are so simple to do, and I bet you've never heard of them. Which is exactly why in this video, I'm gonna walk you through 13 different ways to make your gaming PC even better, from higher frame rates, quieter systems, and even sharing some keyboard shortcuts so good, you wonder how you ever coped without them. So stick around, learn all of them, and change your life forever. All right, maybe that last bit's a little bit strong, but stay tuned to learn everything you need to know right after a short word from this video sponsor. Acer's Predator Orion 7000 is a pre-built desktop powerhouse. Coming equipped with a 13th generation Intel i9 processor and a GeForce RTX 4090 graphics card. Not only does this crush 4K gaming, but it looks incredible too. With RGB Frostblade fans, liquid CPU cooling, and a vertically mounted GPU. Not only that, but selected Acer Predator and Nitro gaming machines even come with one month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate included. So you can get gaming in Age of Empires, Forza Horizon 5, Halo, and much more, all at no extra cost. Learn more today with the link down below. Right, let's get started with the big one. And the single most important tip that I bet half of you here don't even know is hidden within the task manager. Firstly, press Control, Shift, and Escape on your keyboard all at the same time to bring up the task manager. Crucial if you're already in a game. Then hit Options and check the box labeled Always on Top. And what this does is so simple and yet so elegant. Essentially, next time you're running a game and it crashes, instead of you having to restart the whole PC just to get your PC to start working again, you just open up the task manager and end the task because it appears on top of your crash game. Why on earth is this not the default? Bonus tip while we're on this subject, by the way, Editor Carl highly recommends Windows Shift and S, which brings up the selective snipping tool feature that's really handy for taking screenshots on the fly. Now I'm sure loads of you already know this one already, but for anyone new out there, I highly recommend you check out Alt and Tab, as this allows you to cycle through open applications and is the single best way of cycling between an open game and any other windows like your browser or Discord. From one extreme to the other though, something that's a lot more hardcore is something called Advanced Launch Options, and this is very useful for games that are, how should we say, less optimized than others. And I think the most obvious use case for this is actually around Apex Legends, as this is a game that's capped to 140 for FPS by default. And the only way to disable this is to go into Origin or Steam, right click the game, and then add a custom launch option. With Apex, it will be FPS underscore max space unlimited, which unlocks the FPS, but there are many games that can be changed with similar parameters. It's also worth grabbing an application called Notepad++, as some games require even more work. Simply press Windows and E to open up Explorer, then go to View, and hit the box that shows the hidden files and folders, and changing any lines in the settings files with Notepad++. They usually have the extension .ini. For me personally, this has been really useful for unlocking frame rates in games like Batman Arkham Knight, or fixing game crashes where the resolution doesn't match up with what your monitor can display, and every time you try to open it, it just kind of crashes and goes a bit weird. But whoa, hang on a second, Tiger. We got advanced there very quickly. We went from alt tab to ini files. This is a weirdly structured video. How about something a lot simpler? I think we can do that. Let's turn to something a whole lot more practical, actually seeing your FPS in game. And the easiest, most practical way is to go into your AMD or Nvidia GFE panel and then just turn on the option that monitors frame rates. This is great for most users, but these days I want to see the other statistics too. So I use either Nvidia FrameView or MSI Afterburner. FrameView works on pretty much any system with any GPU, and it's usually what you see in my PC build videos, as you get CPU and GPU thermals, clock speeds and utilization. Go Going forward though, I'm actually trying to switch to MSI Afterburner, as you can show way more statistics on screen at the same time, and as we're living in a world where games are using more VRAM, more RAM, and all of the resources at once, it is quite nice to know what the potential bottlenecks are, and if you're going to upgrade, ultimately what you should upgrade. And this actually brings us to our next tip. I thought I'd use the water as a prop, because it's 29 degrees in here again. But anyway, our next tip probably also requires some water cooling, some overclocking. Is it risky? Potentially, but it's definitely worth looking into. And the funny thing is, this is actually what MSI Afterburner was originally designed to do. It lets you overclock your GPU by adding extra clock speed, increasing the power, all of this stuff to your GPU, which increases the rate of work and thus the frame rate in your game. 
Now, granted, in most cases, you're probably not going to see more than 5% extra performance, but it is definitely worth considering if you want to squeeze every single drop out of your graphics card. And don't forget that there's also CPU or processor overclocking as well. This can make a big difference if your game is CPU bound, and this is actually achieved in the BIOS. But I really don't want to turn this into a video that's all about overclocking, because there are three things that you can actually do in the BIOS that I would say arguably far more important and are a lot easier to achieve. Getting to the BIOS in the first place is ridiculously simple. Simple. Just restart your PC and mash the delete key and pretty much wait for it to appear. Once it is open, the first of the three changes to make is to enable the XMP or Expo memory profile on your RAM. If you choose not to do this, then chances are you're going to be running a much slower RAM speed and could lose a fair chunk of FPS in certain titles like Warzone. Note that this is also classed as overclocking, so it does carry some risk, mainly that your PC won't boot and could need a CMOS clear to restore the defaults. Other than that, you'll also want to enable resizable bar to make sure your GPU and CPU communicate properly, again gaining FPS. And then last, but certainly not least, to tune your friggin' fans. And I would definitely describe myself as a little bit of a risk taker, and I'm willing to wager that pretty much half of you out there have never done this. And it's so mad because the difference it makes is quite literally wild. Remember folks, fans don't have to be loud. Please ensure that all of your fans are connected to the motherboard if you're not using some external software with something like Corsair IQ, for instance, and then use the tuning utility that's baked into your BIOS or create some custom curves just to make them quieter. They don't need to be loud. They have a job to do, but you can make your system much less audible or idle. I think one of the biggest questions I get asked literally all of the time is about this, the animated wallpaper. How do you do that? Where's the option? What magic is it? Well, being honest with you, it's the magic that £3.49 gets you, as it's an application on Steam called Wallpaper Engine. It's all pretty seamless, and it just runs in the background and utilises a tiny amount of your GPU horsepower to make your desktop look stunning. There are literally thousands and thousands of them to choose from in the community tab, and they range from chilled and nuanced to big, bold and striking. And yet, while all of this, all of the RGB, everything you see gets all of the attention, the single, like, most important thing I don't think I could do without is actually a light behind your monitor called a bias light. And this doesn't sound very interesting. Don't make it RGB. Yes, I'm using the Hue play bars, for instance, to achieve this. But genuinely, the way your eyes work is they don't like to sort of fluctuate between bright and dark all of the time. So if you're someone that wants to sit in like a dimly lit room, then just have a single light strip. Try and make it diffused if you can behind your monitor, set it to a very low brightness. And then this means that you can sort of sit in this environment for longer without getting eye strain. It's something I've done on pretty much every screen I've had for the last like five to 10 years. And genuinely it makes such a big difference. But let us move on now and chat a little bit more about the gaming itself, because a big mistake that everyone makes when PC gaming is turning their games to ultra settings by default. Wait, what? PC centric? That's one of the reasons you get a PC, to make your games look as good as possible. What blasphemy is this? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's sensible. You see, whilst ray tracing, fancy lighting, tessellation, and loads more features are all pretty darn cool, unless you're getting over 120 FPS, chances are you'll notice a boost to your frame rate a whole lot more. My personal advice is to always use the highest texture settings, the highest draw distance settings that your GPU will allow, and then just go for high on the rest, as this should be optimal for appearance versus frame rate. There's also been a bit of a shift in the world of what I would call clunky game launchers as of late, as now I can use Steam for actually most of the games that I play, including Apex Legends, Warzone, and Cyberpunk rather than needing separate launches for each. But of course, this doesn't help you if you play other games like Fortnite. So a really nice tip is to download an application called GOG Galaxy 2 to help keep on top of it all. What it achieves is simple but effective. It amalgamates your entire PC game library and lets you see everything all in one place with buttons to play opening the game launcher whenever you need it, rather than having them all open all at the same time and utilising precious resources. And when I was writing all of these down, I almost cut this next one out of the script because I thought it's too simple. But at the same time, I guarantee there are people watching this that have never heard of this and are going to have their mind blown. In fact, look, I can do a live demo. Go to Steam, click this little button called Enter Big Picture, 
and suddenly you have a whole controller UI appear on your desktop. And if you are wanting to maybe use like a larger screen and you don't want to have a keyboard and mouse near you or you don't own a wireless one, you can just navigate it all with this. It's so, so simple. And if you are going to use your PC almost like a console, it just makes everything so much easier. You can navigate with your controller and everything on the UI is scaled up so you can actually read it. And hang on a minute, speaking of controllers, this is a bit of an interesting one because chances are, regardless of how you like to play PC games, there will be something in your library you will want to use a controller for. And you're probably thinking, what's the best controller for PC? And the best solution, I'm afraid to say, is going to cost you some money. And of course, this is good old PC gaming, so there are various tools for getting pretty much any controller to work with PC, be it Switch, Xbox or PlayStation. But honestly, they're all quite hit and miss in my experience, which is why most users tend to opt for a wired Xbox controller. This uses X input rather than direct input, which is compatible with pretty much every controller game, but it's wired, which I find annoying. But I hear you cry in the comments. You can use Bluetooth. You can use this wirelessly. Well, have you tried that? Most PCs I've ever used, you've got loads of dropouts, it'll work for a bit and then you get some stick shift or maybe the vibration doesn't work, it cuts out, you can only usually use one controller at the same time. It's really annoying, so if you do use a controller regularly on a PC, or at least you want to, my advice is to spend the money and buy yourself the official Xbox wireless controller adapter. It's great. You can pick them up for roughly £25 on a good day. They not only let you use multiple controllers reliably, but they also work almost instantly and have a much better range than most Bluetooth adapters. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all of the tips that we have time for today. Have you learned anything? Is there anything you want to share? Do you have any tips of your own? Let us know down in the comment section below. Smash the like button if you've enjoyed this. Get yourself subscribed. And if there's something in this video that's caught your eye, or maybe you want to learn more about what's actually in my PC setup, you can find everything linked down below with my Amazon affiliate links. And while you're down there, why not bask in the brilliance of the Acer Predator Orion 7000? This crazy machine packs some serious punch with a mighty RTX 4090 paired with the behemoth 24-core Intel i9-13900K processor. Selected Acer Nitro and Predator gaming machines also come with one month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, allowing you to play the greatest games day one without any extra charge. Get yours today with the link down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'll catch you in the next one.